Jeremy Weiss here. We're here with JD Roth. JD Roth grew his blog GetRichSlowly.org get to over a million monthly visitors per month, became one of Time Magazine's top 25 bloggers, and sold the site for more money than he dreamed was possible. Sounds like a comic book story. I love it. It was not as easy as that, though. And he's going to talk about some of the mistakes he made along the journey, some of the failures, and you know, we often learn our most valuable lessons when we make mistakes. So, JD, thanks for being here. Thanks, Jeremy. Glad to be here. And I always like to include a fun fact before you tell us some of these um, life lessons, le you know, business lessons. And JD, when we were talking, he didn't want to admit how much he spent on com on his comic book collection and has had 10,000 comics before he just sold some. And mm -hmm. everything, in his defense, everything he needed to know about blogging, he says he learned from the comics. Yeah, that's right. I, I spent years building that collection, and uh, uh, like I said, I sold it off for about $25,000, the bulk of the collection. And so you can imagine how much I put into it. But I did learn some valuable lessons from uh, reading comics that I, I was able to apply in the way I write, uh, the way I blog, and they really did influence how I do that. So obviously, you know, people read that, they read your story, they think, oh wow, this is, this is amazing. Obviously, the site's Get Rich Slowly, so it's not quickly, but I want to hear some of the mistakes you made along the way that brought you to where you are now. Um, what was one of those that you remember maybe early on that you didn't know what you didn't know with the site before you, you kind of you know, grew? Well, you know, when I started the site, um, I didn't do it to make money. Well, that's not true. I did it to make money, but I didn't really understand what kind of potential was out there. I started GetRichSlowly.org in 2006, and I thought, oh, Google Ads, that's great. I can make a few bucks a day. I didn't realize there were affiliate programs. I didn't realize I could sell uh, eBooks or anything like that. So for a long time, I was woefully under-monetized. And then uh, in 2008, I uh, went to San Francisco and uh, met a bunch of other personal finance bloggers. And during this conversation, I realized, oh my gosh, I've been leaving tons of money on the table because there are other ways to monetize a site than just Google Ads. And I went back home, I made some changes, and within days, I'd gone from making a, a, a few thousand dollars a month to tens of thousands of dollars a month. And that was shocking. How did you get to that point where you met those people, though? Because there was like some time in there where you know, you were... You had to get to that kind of mastermind meeting. Um, that getting to that point was just uh, a matter of hard work and, and uh, writing about money every day so that people were interested in it. The uh, the mastermind meeting was put together actually by a financial software company who wanted to pick our brains uh, for a new product that they were developing. So they flew. I can't remember exactly how many it was, 10 bloggers, 20 bloggers, something like that, to San Francisco, put us up in a hotel for a couple days, and uh, listened to us brainstorm. But as we were brainstorming for them, we were actually sharing all these ideas with each other. I think we helped each other learn. Yeah, yeah. So how, like when you look back at it, why do you think that you didn't discover that those people or that stuff before that, that meeting? You know, I don't think I was being, I, I wasn't as serious about the blog or about the business as I ought to have been. I had already quit my job, my real job to uh, work full time on the blog. It was supporting me that much. But I just didn't give it enough credit. I, I guess I didn't dream big enough. I didn't have this vision that, oh, how big can I make it? And it was eye opening that, oh my gosh, it can be so much bigger. Yeah, that's true. What was one of the, the things that you remember a mistake that you made maybe just because, um, you know, with your family? I know you worked in the family business. Right. Well, that comes from the blogging again, too. Um, I was really unhappy with, with uh, my job with the family business. So I had been working as a box salesman for uh, 10 or 15 years, and I hated it. I loathed I didn't like boxes, I didn't like sales, I didn't like any of it. And so what I would do is sneak in my office and, and write about money. I'd do my blogging on company time. And this was really frustrating. It was frustrating, uh, especially for my family members who needed me to go out and sell boxes so that they could uh, make some money. 
Uh, but it was frustrating to me, too, because I wasn't fulfilling my obligations. Um, and so we all ended up frustrating. And ultimately, it was a good thing that I quit working for the family business to blog full time. So tell me about one of those run-ins with your family when you were... Well, <laughs> well the biggest one came... This was July of 2007 in August. Uh, my then wife and I went with her family uh, to England for how long were we gone? Three weeks, something like that. And uh, we came back, and my my brother and my cousin they sat me down and they were very stern. They said, "JD, you should never have gone to England. That was the biggest mistake you could have made." It's like, why was that a big mistake? And he said. With you being gone, it only went to show how little you do around here and how, how much we do not need you. Wow. And uh, I was like, oh my gosh. And I was angry at the time and I was defiant. But the reality of the situation was they were absolutely right. I was not pulling my weight and, and I knew it. And that's part of why I was angry. So what happened at that point? Did you leave at that point or did they just no, want... That was August of 2007. Um, I started... I had already decided that if Get Rich Slowly could give me a full-time income every month for a year, then I would quit the box company. And so I, I looked at it, and Get Rich Slowly had been doing that for several months, and I projected it out, and I decided, okay, it needs to be doing this uh, up, I think it was March of 2008. Uh, if it can do it up until then, then I can quit the box company. And so I, I gave myself a timeline. And I did my performance, I have to admit, didn't improve as much as it could have at the box company, but uh, it didn't matter because ultimately I uh, was able to quit and work on the blog full time. So was that hard to hear? I mean, at the time, even though now you look back and you're like, oh yeah, that was true, but it's hard to hear when your family is sitting and telling you you didn't <laughs> do anything. Like, what do you say to them? Well. Okay, there, there are two, I'm thinking of two things here, Jeremy. In some ways, yes, it was hard to hear. But also, I knew that they were telling the truth. And so even though it was hard to hear, I couldn't really argue with it, even though I tried. I think what's tougher is when you have the perception that you're doing really, really well, and somebody else has the perception that you're doing poorly. I think that's hard to hear. And I'm actually going through that uh, on one of my side projects right now. I'm going through that in my own life where... I think I'm doing a great job, but the people I'm working with think I'm doing poorly. And that, that is actually kind of shocking. It boggles my mind. I've never had that happen to me before. And that's so it's tough to hear. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So when, I mean, when you're working in the family business, you didn't feel like you were being true to yourself. Then what flipped when you started doing the blogging? What about it did you feel like, I'm, this is where I need to be? Because people like right now maybe just in something that they feel deep down that they, they shouldn't be doing, but they don't, they can't put their finger on what? Well, I had always known I wanted to be a writer. When I was young, I thought I would end up writing science fiction or poetry or something like that. Because that, that's what I did in my spare time. Is I wrote science fiction stories. I wrote bad poetry. I always wanted to be a writer. Um, and so writing every day, that felt right. It, it's, I knew that's what I needed to be doing. Um, so it wasn't hard to make that flip. I guess the hard part was leading up to quitting or leading up to get rich slowly, it was trying to find an outlet for it because I could never figure out how do I make money writing poetry? How do I write a science fiction story? It just wasn't going to happen. But once I tried to be less specific and more general and to understand, oh, no, I just love writing, things worked out okay. Yeah. So what piece is your favorite that you've written that has nothing to do with finance? Is there something you haven't published yet that... Uh... No. Uh, oh, you mean like offline. I've got some stories that I've written or some poems that I really enjoy. But I think one thing, I'm going to tell you something I did recently that I really, really liked, is I tried to sit down and boil my philosophy, just my life philosophy, not my financial philosophy, boil it down into 100 words. And I managed to do that. And that was a lot of fun for me to spend all this mental energy trying to figure out how do I express my core philosophy, which is pretty systematic, into these 100 words. And now I'm working with a friend of mine who's an artist, and she's designing a poster based around this. Oh, cool. I, it's, it's awesome. I think it's cool. And uh, I, I don't know if anything will come of it, but I don't care. It's just fun to be doing the project. Yeah. As a side note, there was one company I talked to, Holsty, 
that they started doing. Have you heard of it? And that yeah. they sell tons of their that poster. Yeah. Yes, the manifesto exactly. And uh, after I started putting mine together, uh, my friend Lisa said, "Oh, this is just like that manifesto." And I was like, "What?" And she pointed me to it. And I was like, "Oh, darn." <laughs> Yeah, but it's different. You know, it's not going to be the same same manifesto. Um, so, you know, the, so that goes for doing, you know, the research, networking early on, you know, being true to yourself. What about, you know, people see you as the expert? Mm. How does, you know, how does that work? Well, you know, when I, on the cover of my book, let's see what it says. It says J. Someplace in the intro, it says J.D. Roth is an accidental personal finance expert, and somebody called me that uh, once in a newspaper interview, and I really liked it, so I've subscribed to it because I don't think I'm an expert. I'm a regular guy. Yeah. I just I share what I learned along the way. I don't know everything, and I don't. I try not to pretend that I do. And in fact, it's when I do try to be the expert that I get into trouble. Um, Especially if I'm trying to do that in a public forum. If I'm trying to pretend I'm an expert in a public forum, things can get pretty wonky. Yeah, so what was a time where, because I think I'd be self-conscious. I'm on the radio in front of speaking people. I say something wrong or I'm not completely accurate. When was a time like that for you? Well, my very first radio interview, I can't even remember when it was, but it was soon after Get Rich Slowly started. Uh, this radio station from Seattle called and they said, hey, we're doing a story about pro, uh, retirement. Some new study had come out about retirement. Can you be on at noon to be our expert? And I was like, okay. And so instead of just going with it and uh, telling them what I knew, I spent like all morning at the box factory when I should have been selling boxes. I spent all morning researching retirement and researching this study. And I had pages and pages of notes set out on my desk. And so they called at noon and they said, JD, okay, tell us about this study. What do you think? And so instead of giving an honest response, I tried to be the expert. But to do that, I had to look through all the notes in front of me and I couldn't find the note that related. And so what I ended up saying for like 20 seconds straight is people should just save more than they spend. People should just, and the, the woman would try to rephrase the question and I'd say people should save more than they spend. And it was, wow, it was bad. <laughs> was it bad in your mind or was it really bad though? No, it was really bad. She hung up on me. And uh, I mean, she should have. She needed to move on because it was, it was stalled. I was just saying the same thing over and over. And then afterward, to my credit, um, I emailed the woman. I said, hey, I know that didn't go very well. Do you have any advice? And to her credit, she then replied with like five or six things that she, would, she thought I could do better. Huh. And because uh, I think a lot of people view failure as just like this, uh, I don't know, this thing to be ashamed of. But for me... I've learned that if I'm doing poorly, or if I do something poorly, there's an opportunity to learn there. And so I, I try to figure out what I can do better next time. So what did she tell you? Do you I don't remember. I, she said be natural, I know that. She said just be yourself, and that was a very important thing. Um, I'm actually curious what that email message said. And you know what, I bet I can find it too. Okay, I, I know when the date is and everything. I, oh, this is gonna be awesome, okay, research. It goes back to kind of being true to yourself in the other one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I believe strongly that you have to be true to yourself. What about, um, was there any, because I know you've had a lot of speaking engagements, even in front of people. Was there one like that where you, similar to the radio interview that you could talk about? Yeah. Well, so for the first couple of speech and, speaking engagements I did, I also thought I had to be this expert. And so... One in particular, I spoke to the Financial Planning Association, the local chapter of that. And so there were a couple hundred financial planners in this room. And I thought I had to be an expert on personal finance when I was actually there because I was an expert on blogging. So I spent all this time trying to establish my credentials for being an expert on personal finance. When I don't have any, I'm just a regular guy who writes about personal finance. And so instead of focusing on the social media stuff, which is what they wanted to learn about, and this was four or five years ago, um, I focused on all this other stuff where I just revealed my weakness and how little I knew. And so when the question and answer time came, they really gave me a grilling. And I felt, I felt awful about it. But again, I asked the organizer, what can I do better? And he gave me some feedback there too, which was, again, stick to what you know. So tell me about on the other end of it. 
now that you know you take these speaking engagements that you've done when was someone a time when you were yourself that you're especially proud of well I, i've had a couple of those so a few years ago, I'm trying to figure it's 2000. So 2009, I was asked to speak at this small conference of bloggers called the Savvy Blogging Summit. And I flew to Colorado. And what they wanted was my story about how I got involved with blogging. And because this is something that I knew by heart, and because it was who I am, I was able to get in there and give them, give them an awesome presentation. And I knew it was awesome uh, while I was giving it. And it, it's because I knew it so well and I practiced it. And uh, you know, the question and answers were good too. And then from there, I've gone on uh, to do larger and larger speaking gigs. So, for example, in 2012, I spoke at the World Domination Summit, which is a conference that I helped organize. And we had a thousand people come to Portland, and I spoke on my personal transformation, the changes I've made over the past 10, 20 years to become who I am today. And I was able to get in front of a thousand people, and that didn't go perfectly smoothly. But I realized, oh, I'm not afraid of the audience. It's not speaking in front of the audience that scares me. It's lack of preparation that scares me. And so from that experience, I've been moving on uh, so that now I'm willing to speak in front of crowds. And I know that the preparation is vital for public speaking. And I'm wanting to do more of it so I can practice and become better. What do you mean lack of preparation? Like what did you not do and you thought it could have went better? Well, when I spoke in front of the World Domination Summit, I again spoke about my life, so it's yeah. material I know pretty well. But even if that's the case, I need to get up there and uh, I need to rehearse the material uh, so that I know as I'm delivering it what's going to happen and I don't make any, uh, I don't trip up. But let me give you another example from this year's World Domination Summit. I didn't do a full-fledged talk, but I did do two speaker introductions in front of 3,000 people. We grew this year from 1,000 to 3,000. Wow. The first introduction, I knew cold. It was awesome. I got up there, psh, nailed it, got off. The second introduction, I had less time to prepare. I had it down pretty well, but I told a joke on stage, and it got a much bigger response than I thought. And people just laughed like crazy, and oh, it threw me off my game and because I hadn't prepared. And then I ad-libbed after that. I told another joke, ad-libbing, <laughs> and then it threw me off, and so the, I, because I wasn't prepared, I got lost. That's a good problem to have, though. People are laughing at your jokes. I yeah, know. I all of a sudden I can see. Oh, this is what comedians. This must be what it's like. You get up there and tell a Tanya Harding joke, which is what I told. <laughs> tell a Tanya Harding joke. It gets a big groan and a big laugh. And you tell another one. And, ah, I didn't want to leave the stage. So how did you? You know, you're speaking in front of the the first thousand people. How do you boil down twenty years into? like a 30 or 40 minute speech. Like what did you include it? What did you feel a need? Like I need to include this, this story, like people will relate to it. Well, I've made, it's easy for me to identify the fundamental changes that I've made in my life. So it made it easier to boil down um, what it was I needed to convey. So for example, I've lost 50 pounds. I've, I've got rid of $35,000 in consumer debt and sold a business so that I, I built some wealth. Um, I've changed the way I relate to people. I used to be a very severe introvert. Now I'm an extrovert. Um, and I made changes in uh, my relationships too. Uh, I was in a marriage where it wasn't, it wasn't going well. And so I ended the marriage. And uh, now both my ex-wife and I are much happier and have maintained a good friendship. So what did you do to become an extrovert? I know well, all those like big things I ask about that, but I'm curious because a lot of people are sitting behind their computer and like, what'd you do? So you and I have talked off mic about some of what my projects are, and I haven't mentioned the fact that one of the things I'm working on now is uh, researching fear, um, overcoming fear. Yeah. And uh, so one of the things that I did was just say, screw it. I'm going to chat with people, even though it scares the heck out of me. I used to get emails all the time from people who would say, hey, JD, can I meet with you? And I'd say, no, 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 because uh, I was afraid, you know, maybe they're axe murderers. It's the internet after all. People <laughs> get together and meet with me. Um, but the bottom line was I was just scared. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I was scared of what people would think of me. And eventually I started saying yes. And as I started taking these meetings, good things would come of them. I developed friendships. 
one of my uh, best friends and uh, strongest business relationships is with Chris Gillibo, and that came about because I took a meeting that he requested. And as time has gone on, I've realized I enjoy meeting and talking with these different people. I enjoy hearing their stories, and I really enjoy trying to help people connect. If I meet somebody who is uh, working on, oh, I can't think of an example now, but, but working on some sort of project, I can often find somebody else that they should be working with uh, that might be able to help them. And connect them, yeah. So what's been a painful moment in this journey for you that you could talk about? Well, I think the most painful uh, moment of all uh, has got to be my divorce. Um, divorce is never a happy thing. It's never a good thing. And it's especially a sad thing when there's no chronic or no uh, acute crisis that's causing it. Uh, no infidelity, uh, no alcoholism, no whatever. Um, just a fundamental long-term unhappiness. Um, so a couple of years ago, I did ask for my, my wife for a divorce because um, we were unhappy. We were not good to each other. We were not kind to each other. And uh, it, it was a very painful thing, the hardest thing I've ever done. Um, but ultimately, it was for the best, for both her and for me. Yeah. What about, what's a piece of advice you can give the audience to make sure that they know, like someone starting out? In other words, what, would, what did you give to someone recently or what do you tell someone about that? I want to start my first website. Oh, so my big thing, and I preach this at every conference I go to or whenever I meet with anybody who wants advice on what they should do with their business or their blog, is I think personal story is probably the best way for people to connect with each other. Um, everyone can, anyone can give you facts and figures. I think one of the reasons I was so successful with my personal finance site is I didn't get on there and try to be an expert. I didn't get on there and say, okay, these are the facts. This is how you do a 401k. This is how you do a Roth IRA. This is what you should do with credit cards. Instead, I got on and I told my story. I told about how I was struggling with finance. I told about my process for signing up for a credit card. Um, I wrote about my investment mistakes, about how I invested in Sharper Image and then lost $4,000. I, I, I wrote about these things and I shared my story. And I think that by doing so, people were able to relate to me. And so I preach this all the time uh, when I meet with other bloggers, obviously, but also with people who are wanting to start small businesses. Because I've, from what I've seen, any business can have a compelling story and use that story so that they connect with their potential customers. So I wrote down to mention or ask about Dave's Killer Bread. Yes. Okay, so this is a, a local example. I feel like uh, small local businesses often do best at telling their stories. And this is a great one. So Dave's Killer Bread, this is an ex-con who got out of jail and instead of reverting to a criminal activity, he decided to hell with it, I'm going to start a business. He, he liked baking bread. So he started baking bread, he started a bread factory, and now he's got one of the this successful business, a huge operation here uh, a couple miles from my house. And he sells Dave's Killer Bread and he sells it in Whole Foods and all the natural food stores. And uh, people love it, they love the story. And that's why they buy his bread. Well, it's good bread too, you gotta have a good product. You can't just survive the right. story alone. But I think this is true for uh, uh, large companies as well. If you look at Apple, when they do advertising, at least when they do their good advertising, they're trying to sell a story about who you could become. Um, who They're trying to tell you what their products can do for you to change your own story. Right. So, and I think people like the story of Steve Jobs uh, starting Apple in his garage, you know, um, along with Wozniak. It's a story helps connect people to your business. Yeah, we relate to that. Yeah. What's a, a good piece of advice you got from a mentor that's been valuable to you? Well, this is more specific than it is general. Now, a lot of times I like to speak in generalities because they're applicable to everybody. But in my case, I didn't think I had mentors, to be honest, as I was working on the blog. Um, but I met this guy he came to me for blogging advice, really. He asked me for a meeting, and I took it. This is back when I was making the transition from introvert to extrovert. 
And uh, I gave him some blogging advice. And then he's like, JD, why don't you have a book? I was like, I, well, I'm scared to do a book. He's like, you need to have a book. And uh, he gave me advice about uh, writing a book. And then when I actually landed a book deal, he gave me lots more advice about how to write the book and uh, how to negotiate the contract. And then uh, a couple of years later, when I sold Get Rich Slowly, I went back again to this fellow and he was he had sold a couple of companies before. I asked him for advice on uh, selling my blog and without him, I would have been stuck in the weeds. He helped me see what I needed to do. Sometimes it's hard to ask people for advice because then you want to be seen as the expert or you, you know, how do you get over that? You know, some people are like, well, I, I don't want to ask that dumb question. I don't want to come off it like that. Yeah, you, you, you got to be, I mean? be vulnerable. Right. I mean, um, I don't know. It, I told you earlier about that uh, credo that I wrote that I, I'm proud of recently. And one of the things on there is ask for what you want. And it has taken me a long time to learn this because – I'm the kind of guy who, if he had served something incorrectly in a restaurant, I'll just eat what I was served incorrectly. Right. Yeah. I, I didn't order the tuna, I ordered the steak. Well, I'm gonna eat the tuna because the waiter brought it to me. No, I've learned that there's nothing wrong in asking for what you want. You're not necessarily always going to get it, but I think one of the keys to successful people is they do ask for what they want. Yeah. I'm thinking real ta a tangent real quick here. Uh, one of the speakers at World Domination Summit this year was a fellow named Sha Young, and he's a, he's got a website um, where he talks about his hundred days of rejection therapy. Hmm. And what he's doing is he's just going around asking people one person a day for something unusual. He asked to drive a police car. He asked to uh, have Krispy Kreme donuts make him donut shaped like the Olympic greens. He asked to play soccer in a stranger's backyard. All, all these random things, and it's just his way of getting over rejection. But he's learning to ask for what he wants, and uh, I think it's important. I like that. I'll have to check that out because I'm now I'm curious of like what he actually, what someone said yes to. And uh -huh. What about, you know, you, we know that we get a lot of good advice, but we get bad advice too. What's, what's a not so good piece of advice that you've, you've gotten that's found to be untrue? Well, you know, one thing I think that people tell me over and over again is when something's not working, they tell me to stick with it. And I get that you don't want to be a quitter. I get that you don't want to run away from things at a moment's notice, but I also think it's insane. In fact, it's one of the definitions of insanity to keep doing something that doesn't work. And so I can think of a specific time uh, when I first got out of college, my first job was selling insurance door to door in Eastern Oregon and the rural communities. I'd go door to door knock, say, hey, I believe this would interest you also for only 58 cents a month or whatever it was. 58 cents a day, you can have this insurance policy. And it was lousy insurance, and I knew it, and I hated the job. And I knew that I should never have taken it, and I knew I should quit. So I wanted to quit. And uh, uh, my ex-wife, or she was fiancé at the time, she's like, no, 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 you cannot quit. And my dad said, no, no, you cannot quit. And so I stuck with it, and I hated it. I hated it. There was nothing good that came of that. And uh, the same has been true with uh, other situations in my life where – I, it's broken and I know it's broken and I keep trying to fix it and people tell me to stick with it instead of cutting my losses and moving on. Yeah, no, that's a good one because oftentimes it also comes with outside pressure that you're not yourself. It goes back to that same theme like you're not yourself. You're taking outside pressure where it just didn't feel right to you. If it felt right, maybe you would stick with it. And that's exactly right. There's a feeling when these moments happen, there's a feeling in my gut that no, I need to stop this. I should not be doing this. And it's when I ignore that feeling in my gut that it, it's, ugh, I don't like it. Yeah. And I know I was asking too about before, what's an example that we haven't talked about? Because I wanted to hear some of the mistakes we can learn from. And you told me that um, we can't regret things. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So I think it's possible to regret things if, if you're in a bad place or you're unhappy or, I mean, if you're on the Titanic and you're sinking you probably regret not listening to people's advice. But I think in my case, I'm a happy man. I'm in a good spot in my life. I have an amazing life, an amazing girlfriend. I do work that fulfills me. And because of that, I can't regret any of the mistakes that I've made in the past. 
sure they're mistakes. Sure, I wish they hadn't happened. But I am who I am today because of the things that have come before, both the positive and the negative. So I have one last question for you, JD. I'm really excited to actually ask you this. Um, I've been thinking about this since we first started talking. But um, before we do, I want you to tell us a little bit about what you're working on now. What are you most excited about? Well, actually, I told you this earlier. Uh, my girlfriend sat down with me a couple weeks ago and she said, JD, you have so many ideas in your head and you're bouncing back and forth between them all. You need to write them down and then prioritize. And so I wrote them all down. I want to write a book. I want to write another book. I want to sell an online course. I want to. I told you I want to uh, start a business that sells maps for travelers, actually good maps that you can put in your pocket. And I've got all these ideas, and I, I don't know which ones to do first. So I wrote this all out and uh, made priorities, and I realized that many of the uh, things that I want to work on are predicated on uh, going back to work uh, at Get Rich Slowly, writing again at Get Rich Slowly, where I wrote for six years but then quit a year ago. And so uh, starting this week, I'll be back there. So how do you decide what to pursue first, though? Because a lot of people have tons of ideas, and where do you start? Well, in this case, there were two things. First of all, I think it's important to start with what's, what makes you most excited. Uh, and, and in this case, uh, we've talked a little bit about fear, and I, I've been working on a, a book about fear, and uh, I, I just taught a course at World Domination Summit about fear. I'm going to do it again next month. Um, so this excites me, helping people overcome fear and build confidence. So that's one thing I'm going to work on. But the other one was the other thing that I chose I did for pragmatic reasons. And that is uh, returning to Get Rich Slowly. Yes, I'm excited about doing it. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. But so many of my other goals depend on writing at Get Rich Slowly, developing my chops there, connecting with the audience, all sorts of things that it just makes perfect sense. Yeah, but... You have your chops. What do you mean developing your chops? <laughs> no, even even Michael Jordan had to go out and shoot free throws every day, right? True, true. So that's, that's what I'm doing here is I'm going to go out and shoot my free throws. Got it. I like that analogy. No, the, the last question I have for you, which I think all of us struggle with internally, some more than others, is, and you, you probably get a lot of this on the blog throughout the years, is excuses. Mm-hmm. You know, People have just, from their own background, form all these excuses. Mm -hmm. what, what excuses have you found yourself, you've given for yourself, and kind of how you um, have overcome them? Or maybe now or before? One big one that I do all the time is that I don't have time. I always write about not having time. Um, but I, you see, I grab my... Uh, my book, a copy of my book from the bookshelf. Don't I end with... Oh, I don't. I thought I ended the book with this particular anecdote that I was going to give you. Uh, but I always come up with the excuse that I don't have time. And I've learned that that's not true. I have time to do the things that are important to me. Um, when I was still working at the box factory, box factory, I remember one day I was talking with my cousin and uh, I said that exercise is a priority to me. He said, no, it's not, J.D. He said, yeah, exercise is a priority to me. He said, no, it's not. You're 40, 50 pounds overweight. It's not a priority to you. If it's a priority, you do it. The things that are your priorities are not the things you say are priorities. They're the things you actually do. And so he said, for you, your priority is going home and playing World of Warcraft and reading your comic books. And this had a profound effect on my life, this, this uh, understanding that priorities are the things we do, not the things we say we want to do. And so... I learned this uh, habit, uh, I forget where I learned it, but uh, it's called the big rocks. And it's a way to overcome excuses, it's a way to put your priorities first. And that is, uh, is there's this analogy. Say you've got a jar and you want to put some rocks in it, and there's some big rocks, some middle-sized rocks, and some sand. Well, if you put the sand in first, and then the little rocks, and then the big rocks, you're never going to get everything inside there, because the big rocks won't fit in between the sand and everything. But if you start by putting the big rocks in first, and then you put in the pebbles, and then you put in the sand, you can get everything in the jar, but you've got to start with the big rocks first. And so for me, uh, getting over making excuses uh, was learning to put the big rocks in my life first, and that includes exercise. At one time, it included Spanish lessons. Um, 
and it includes writing. Writing is very important to me. Yeah. JD, I appreciate your time because um, I know you just said that's one of the excuses you made. So, um, but thank you so okay. much for. You don't even know this, but I, I was going to go work out at noon, but now I'm going to have to do it later. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just ruined your priorities. <laughs> I got into this. I this is too much fun. I so, appreciate it, JD, yeah. and uh, I look forward to meeting in person. And, and thanks so much for sharing. Yeah, thanks for talking.